back, everybody. I am pleased to be joined with Justin here, who goes by uh, the Deconstruction Zone as well on TikTok, YouTube, probably Instagram as well. I, I just opened an Instagram account, and I've got two videos, so I'm barely there. Nice, nice, nice. So um, I'm going to let you do your own introduction, I guess, before we get into the uh, topic of discussion. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, so um, I'm kind of in the deconstruction space, as they would call it on TikTok. And uh, my particular area of interest is deconstructing uh, the Bible. Um, I don't do a lot of deconstruction for like religious trauma or things like that. Um, so I, my niche is kind of like um, picking the Bible apart for the most for the most of the time. Uh, but that being said, um, the reason why I, I don't um, do I don't do a lot of like um, anti uh, specific religion other than Christianity is because that is my background in education. So um, I've got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in biblical studies. Oh, wow. And it was studying the Bible that led me away from Christianity. Um, if you study the book enough and you see how the sausage is made, uh, eventually you don't want to eat that sausage. And uh, that was certainly my case. Uh, even going into seminary, people were like, well, they call it uh, cemetery for a reason. And don't, <laughs> uh, don't lose your faith while you're there. And uh, it's true. The fact of the matter is the more you learn about the Bible, the harder it is to take the Bible seriously. Um, so I spend, um, uh, outside of work, I'm electrical engineer by trade, um, outside of work. Um, this is what I do. I, I talk about the Bible. That's awesome. So did you go, a lot of people, you know, their journey with this is like, well, I wanted to study it because I wanted to go into a ministry or because like I, I went to Catholic school and I just wanted to know more about it. So, or people like Alex O'Connor, he got a degree in it because he never believed in it, but he wanted to understand it better. So what was your pathway into like the, the scholarship of it motivated by or whatever? Right. Well, kind of dual purpose. Um, so I, I was always interested in the, the history of the Bible, the manuscript, the languages, things like that at a young age, because I went to Catholic school growing up. And I went to a decent Catholic school where we actually learned things and like read the Bible. So like I already had questions moving into young adulthood. Uh, I was kind of primed. Um, so even like at age 14 or 15, I, I already had developed this kind of idea that uh, eventually when I'm done with school, I'd like to uh, study the original languages of the Bible and get to know the manuscript evidence and history. And because if, if this is true, it's kind of like the most important thing. Um, so, and that's literally what I did. And as I got older into my, my teenage years, um, I kind of got selected, of uh, kind of picked out among my peers to start leading various ministries in the church that I was going to. I was never Catholic though. I went to non-denominational churches. And so I, I, I kind of, I kind of got pushed a little bit into ministry and it turned out that I enjoyed it. So I did participate in various ministries all throughout my educational career. So I've worked for Lutheran churches, Presbyterian churches, so, uh, so on and so forth, non-denominational churches. Um, but um, I, I haven't worked for a church for, for over a decade. Uh, I got to a point where um, even before I finished seminary, I had, I had already decided that the it's hard to, to be in ministry when you don't really fully understand, uh, not understand, but... Um, you don't fully see a point in um, like faking being a Christian because you just don't believe it. At a certain point, you have to admit that you don't believe it anymore. Um, so that was kind of my journey. For me, it was something that I loved to do. I wanted to do it, even though it led me away from the faith. It's still the most interesting topic I could talk about. I, I, I could talk about it every day. Did you say, I think you said you were never Catholic, but you went to Catholic school? They yeah, that? so they do it, it, it kind of. So there's there's a thing, right? So my mom was a non non practicing Catholic, and my father was a Baptist. Um, and so what you do then is uh, when you want to enroll your student in um, in Catholic school, either you have to um, like go through catechism and be a member of the church, or you have to claim membership in like a previous Catholic church. 
um, you can kind of transfer it sometimes. And that's kind of what my mom did. My mom was like, well, I've been a Catholic all my life, even though she didn't go to church. She didn't have any memberships anywhere. Um, the school I went to was willing to take us on good faith. So did you ever get confirmed? I did as part okay. of the process. Yeah. You can choose to get confirmed through the church that you're a part of or through another Catholic church. And okay. I did get confirmed. Uh, it would be my eighth grade year. So just before high school. So you didn't get like grandfathered in you, uh, you did actually. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I never I guess really heard it. Well, I don't know how it works. I mean, I didn't go to a religious school there. There aren't very many of them in South Dakota. So <laughs> there's like, I could imagine. I don't know. Well, actually, there's probably a ton of tiny ones that I don't even know exist, but there's only a few, like, big-time ones. Sioux Falls O'Gorman, Aberdeen Ron Colley, uh, uh, there's Sioux Falls Christian, Rapid City Christian. Nobody knows what I'm talking about because it's South Dakota. But anyways, moving on. So um, I just find your ability to, like, cross-reference passages and books and chapters and verses all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, because you really talk a lot about um, f failed prophecies. Like, I, I would say you focus mostly on, like, a a, a Christianity approach with with the Bible and, and deconstruction. I mean, that's, that's your thing, deconstructing Christianity. Um, I, I find that all really fascinating. So my... I guess in your introduction, my first question was kind of like, how did this whole journey start for you? But I mean, you got the bachelor's and the master's degrees in it. So that basically, but I assume you continue to just study this stuff every single day, right? Yeah, I still do. And um, I tell you, the prophecies are maybe my favorite topic. Somehow it kind of became my bread and butter. But it was, um, it was never my intention to study that topic when I was in school. Um, I had a friend, uh, that uh, a female that I did a Bible study with uh, for a little while, and she already finished her bachelor's degree before me. And we were talking about, uh, we'll say, like some of the, you know, what are some of the methods you could use to talk to a stranger that would lead them to understand that Christianity is something of substance? And uh, I said, well, you know, it's I think it's remarkable that Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. And I mean, I was only 21 when I said this. I, I had finished my engineering degree, but I didn't uh, go to Bible college yet. And she was like, uh, Justin, I don't actually know if that's a good talking point. And I said, well, what? I thought that was a great talking point. She's <laughs> yeah. like, I've read the prophecies and I don't find them to be that convincing. I don't think you should either. And she's like, I, I want you to go back home and read all of the prophecies mentioned in the New Testament and then tell me what you think. And I did. Um, I read every single prophecy that was listed in the New Testament in, in the actual Old Testament context to see what they were talking about. Not a single one of them was talking about Jesus, not even close. Oh, boy. And um, that was enough for me to um, to already to, to move to a position where I, even in Bible college, I was like, yeah, the prophecies, we can just kind of write those off. That's not a good not a good point to, to bring up because it only works if you don't read the prophecies. If you, or or if you let somebody tell you what they are, I once yeah. heard uh, his name's Peter Atkins. He's like a he's a physicist. He's a militant atheist. I don't really like his style all that much, but he he described the Bible in a way that I just found absolutely great because he said it's composed of these elastic words, and I was like, it, he's British, so they're way better at at English than we are. Um, but yet you can stretch them to mean whatever you want because they don't mm. literally, I mean, they do literally say things sometimes like we'll get to Alma later. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Oh yeah. But other times they don't really say anything like the blood of the lamb will be spilled. And that was the crucifixion. It's like, well, it could be literally anything, which is, which means it means nothing. So you could. So we'll, we'll get to all that um, in a little bit. Yeah. I suspect the number one Christian defense yeah. of everything is elastic words. As long as words don't have definitive meanings, you can make the passage say anything you want it to. And when they do, uh, well, I don't know. When they do have literal meanings, it just, uh, I actually have one for that later. I'll, I'll save it for later. But okay. So I suspect the answer to this question is yes. But do you like the Bible? I mean, like, there's some 
kind of horrible stuff in it, but it is also fascinating in many ways. I happen to like the moral teachings of Jesus. I think Paul or whoever was pretending to be Paul in a lot of those letters really did Jesus a disservice with some of the like misogynistic and whatever stuff they said. But do you like the Bible? Yeah, you know, I like parts of it. Um, there was a moment in my life where I would have even said, like, I'm a, a secular Christian. Like, I like the teachings of mm. Jesus Christ, but I don't really believe that this stuff is true. Um, and I, I still like the teachings of Jesus for the most part, except, you know, when he advocated for stoning the unruly children. children that was kind of a problem. Um, but, like, I do enjoy the teachings of Jesus, and I think that... Like if we for if we put these like practices into our own lives, like we we didn't judge other people. Uh, we worried about the log in our own eye as opposed to the speck in another's eye. Like these are things that would be beneficial for society. Um, but I don't think that we need to imagine somebody resurrected from the dead to say that hey, I think these teachings are good. Yeah, mortal people can say true things, <laughs> valuable true things. It's it's totally possible. Yeah, and then there's and then there's just the the awkward asymmetry of the most the most vocal um, Christian people in our country, like Christian nationalists and evangelicals or whatever. They're just so un Jesus like in in so many ways. They're very they're very Paulian in many ways, like. Um, you know, it's Paul who says something to the effect of there is nothing that goes against God, which is not from Satan. There's a first century Christian that says something almost identical to that, too. And that's that that's just incredibly divisive, horrible language. And it's up to the believer to decide what is in accordance with God. Right. Um, and so that just gives you license to just say anything is literally the worst thing. And... That, uh, right. yeah, that's that's all. I'm reading a book right now called uh, The American Myth, I think it's called, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American. I can't remember who the author is off the top of my head, but um, that's been a cool book to read so far. But, yeah, I wish, I wish people were a little more like take care of those who are dispossessed, ostracized, uh, marginalized, oppressed, whatever. Be very wary of people with power and people um, with a lot of money. And it's so weird right now, like the the political right has aligned itself with like a lot of talking head religious folks, like the, the Family Research Council and Jerry Falwell Jr. now or whatever. And it's like, you guys are kind of the new high priests, the people that Jesus raged about um, constantly because sure. uh, they aligned themselves <laughs> with government and were... And we're trying to, like, he wasn't calling them unbelievers, but he was like, you have lost your way. And yeah, I just, I, I am an atheist, but I, I, I hope that uh, progressive Christians or atheists who can meet Christians on their own terms can start communicating, like, let's be just, let's be more like Jesus, you know, because it's not going to work to just call people bigots and say like, well, what you believe in is false, first of all. So blah, blah, blah. So anyways kind of preaching now so let's get back to what we were talking about well, no go ahead your point i do i do find it effective like when you get a hostile christian it is sometimes effective to like remind them hey well jesus said to do this um and sometimes that can kind of calm them down and bring them back to sanity but a lot of times not so much a lot of times they say well we're all sinners we're all imperfect i we all fall short of the glory of god it's like right so you can just be the worst person ever, but if you if you take communion, then everything's fine. Or if you just believe, whatever. Anyways, right. um, I got the wafer. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So we're gonna get into the prophecies. That's gonna be kind of the the meat of this, because um. Sure. I I'm using this as a, as a learning opportunity, everybody as well. So this will be good for me, I think. Um. The most common thing I see you discussing is, you know, Jesus fulfilling no prophecies. So, I mean, there are supposedly hundreds of these. I don't know what the number is, like 587 or something like that. But um, Just depending on who you're talking to. True, true, true. Um, so, without going into hundreds of them, 
what would what are the most common ones you hear? And then maybe we'll get into like what are your favorite ones to either debunk because it's so easy to do or ones that are just like have a fascinating, complicated like history to them or whatever. So we'll start with like what are the most common? I think the most common is that he's born in Bethlehem and that comes from Micah chapter five. The second most common, uh, and I don't know why this is so common, but everyone said, well, he rode the donkey. That's Zechariah 9.9. Nine. Well, the two donkeys. And then... That's right. He double donkeyed it. That's for sure. <laughs> double donk. Um, the the most I would say the two most famous ones, the ones that everyone wants to talk about, is the virgin birth. Uh, yeah. Which surprisingly, if you read the prophecy, it says nothing about that. Um, and then the most common that they bring up is like uh, dying for your sins. And that is kind of um, what they take away from Isaiah 53, even though Isaiah 53 is about the nation of Israel quite clearly. And then um, another one that comes up a lot, but this one only comes up with Christians who have actually read the Bible. A lot of people will say Psalm 22, verse 16 and 17 is a prophecy about Jesus' crucifixion. Um, but um, a lot of people, like a lot of Christians who aren't used to reading the Bible, stick with the basic ones. He was born in Bethlehem, and he was born of a virgin, and he died for your sins. Okay, um, I want to I want to try to unpack a few of those, like specifically, to just talk about why they fail. Um, so we can start with the uh, it, it's Matthew that tells the the virgin birth one, uh, Matthew chapter two, and uh, John lists a couple prophecies he only lists about eight all the rest of them actually come from matthew mm. um between uh, mark and luke you've got maybe three prophecies that's about it yeah huh yeah yeah i've i've heard that but when i read uh misquoting jesus um oh, ermin, ermin was like yeah matthew was really obsessed with the idea of like trying to have jesus like perform miracles and fulfill prophecies and others were like yeah he doesn't really do a whole lot of that Right. So, um, the, the born of the virgin that from what I understand, that's just literally talking about, it says a Alma, a young woman, and it says she will conceive before the city is sieged or something like it very clearly talks about, it's talking about an event right. that's going to happen. So let's just read it and then we can actually. Yeah. Let's talk about unpack, what, really um, what Matthew, cause Matthew makes a big mistake. Sure. Before we read uh, what's in the Old Testament, Matthew says that this was uh, to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they uh, will name him Emmanuel. And you've got a couple problems here because that's not in the Old Testament text. Um, in fact, uh, he's quoting from the Greek, not the Hebrew Old Testament. That's why it's mm -hmm. different. But there's there's more problems here because even when he quotes from the Greek, he misquotes it. The Greek doesn't say they will name him Emmanuel. But that's an interpolation by Matthew. And he changed it from she, meaning the mother of the child, to they, because he wants to make it sound more like Jesus. Well, they just being anybody, anybody who calls him Emmanuel is fulfilling this prophecy. Um, so Matthew is kind of doing a disservice even to the Greek Old Testament. Um, but it should be noted that like translators of the Greek Septuagint, um, ever since... Uh, like Brenton, has always noted that the translation of Isaiah is one of the worst Greek translations of the Hebrew Old Testament in the Bible. It should not be trusted. Um, but he gets it right. Uh, the, the Greek Septuagint does say, uh, behold, the virgin shall conceive, meaning future. Yeah. Um, but this is just the Greek translation getting it wrong. And let's go back and read what Isaiah said. And this is going to be an English rendering, obviously, of the Hebrew. And I'm reading from the NRSV. Um, I'm going to change it only slightly, um, but um, I'll, I'll explain why. So the prophecy in Isaiah 7 is, as you said, it's about King Ahaz. He's the king of Judah. And he's under attack by King Reason and King Pekah, the two kings of Aram and northern Israel. And of course, he's afraid his kingdom's going to fall. And so um, Isaiah sends three different prophecies to him saying, no, 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 you're not going to fall. The king of Assyria is going to come down from the north and he's going to wipe out these two other kingdoms. 
and it's it's going to be horrible. It's the the threat is going to come up to your neck, but you're also you're going to get through it. You'll survive it. The second of those prophecies starts in verse ten, and that's the prophecy that everyone thinks is about Jesus. So we'll read through it. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, and let it be as deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and is bearing a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse evil and choose good. For, before the child knows how to refuse evil and choose good, the land before you whose two kings you are dreading will be deserted. So, just on the face of it, we've got a prophecy that's clearly for King Ahaz. Yeah, this woman's already uh, pregnant. She's already pregnant. Uh, the Hebrew word is hara. And you can translate that as an adjective or a verb. If it's an adjective, it's present tense. If it's a verb, it's past tense, meaning she has already become pregnant. Um, and then the next word, when it says bearing a son, my translation says shall bear a son, which is a legitimate way to translate that. You could also translate it as a participle saying, and is bearing a son, because the verb does show up in a participle form. And the interesting thing is um, most translations say that she will call him or name him Emmanuel, but the literal rendering is she shall call his name Emmanuel. Um, the funny thing is Jesus was never named Emmanuel. Um, and in fact, nobody in the Old Testament was ever named Emmanuel or called Emmanuel other than the son of Isaiah. Oddly enough, if you read Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah has a son with the prophetess. And as the prophecy is actually coming true, the prophecy, uh, if you read verse 17 and 18, you'll see that the prophecy is saying, before this child is old enough to know right from wrong, the king of Assyria is going to wipe out these other two kingdoms. And then in verse uh, chapter 8, I mean, uh, that happens. It actually happens. Um, and then as it's happening, the prophet exclaims, O Emmanuel, Band together your peoples and be dismayed. Listen, all of you far off countries, gird yourselves and be dismayed. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand because Emmanuel, God is with us. So the prophecy clearly in context is just saying that before this child is old enough to know right from wrong, God's going to deal with these two kingdoms. He's going to use the kingdom of Assyria to do it. And then it comes true. And so if this happened, this is 725 years before Jesus was even a twinkling in um, whoever knocked up Mary's eye, then there's no way this is about Jesus. Yeah, I just, I mean, you hear that and it's so confusing to me why anybody would even use that. Because if you read it, like the entire arc of that story concludes in a few verses or a few chapters or whatever, that she'll have the son, she has the son. And she, the, the before the sun would know right from wrong, the invasions would stop, and then they do stop. How could this possibly be about somebody that isn't born? I just, I don't get it. <laughs> I, right. like, I don't get and the attempt to even uh, try that. The it's passage, um, passage never says this child's important. Never says this child is a messiah. Never says that this child is divine. This child is obviously a sign of the Lord. And if you read chapter 8, uh, later on, Isaiah says, the Lord has given me these children to be a sign. Yeah. So um, it's pretty clear what it's about. But Matthew is is making it one other mistake here, because if you go to the Greek, the Greek says a virgin will conceive instead of a young woman, Alma in Hebrew. But uh, at the time Isaiah lived, at, and the time that um, it would have been translated into Greek, Parthenos doesn't necessarily mean just a young woman who's never had sex. Um, in fact, if you go to like the uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon and other Greek lexicons, they'll demonstrate to you in other texts that Parthenos could also refer to any young woman. Um, it's not always a virgin, but Matthew specifically interpreted that word as it must refer to a virgin, but it doesn't. You could read Homer, you could read Aristotle, you can even read Genesis, Genesis chapter 34, when it talks about Dinah after she's raped by Shechem. 
um, it calls her a Parthenos. Well, she's not a Parthenos. She just had sex with the Shechem yeah. against her own will. So Matthew is doing something even with the Greek text that is not warranted. He's he's obviously not as as literate as we might be led to believe whoever Matthew was. <laughs> Some tax collector can't even read. Yeah. <laughs> um, other like other hu- I was just uh, thinking about this like other huge problems with those Greek translations is ancient Greek. There's no distinction between uppercase and lowercase letters. There's just no such thing. There's just one. We'll call it uppercase because I feel like it. There is no spacing between words. There is no punctuation. Um, so like the idea that people would correctly and accurately write this all down is just absurd. And we know for a fact that illiterate people copied it down. I could copy Chinese uh, I, and I can't read it, but I just copy the. But I would I would. I would make subtle but important mistakes if I did that. I'm certain, especially if you had thousands of me doing this for hundreds of years, it would it would just inevitably happen. Um, doesn't Matthew also quote completely the wrong book or chapter in a prophecy that he gives? Kind of. It, it depends on how charitable you are to Matthew. Uh, there's a there's a location where he quotes I want to say from Zechariah and attributes it to Jeremiah. Um, I've actually got it written in the in like the margin of my Bible, but I forget which prophecy it was. But yes, there are two prophecies in the Gospels that are actually attributed to the wrong author, and um, a lot of people they'll jump through hoops and bend over backwards to find a way to justify it. Yeah. When the reality of the matter is, um, he probably just got the wrong prophet. And I, honestly, as a Christian, I, that didn't bother me because even something like that, like honestly, we we have manuscripts um, where that has been edited to the right prophet. So it's possible that the wrong prophet being in our text is just a scribal error that, that got out of control during transmission. Um, but that does bring up another problem is, and Bart Ehrman talks about this, the transmission of the manuscripts has um, been less than stellar. And uh, Kip Davis actually had, had talked about this a lot because he studied the Old Testament uh, text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, the book of Jeremiah was being edited for hundreds of years after um, it was originally composed. Um, like chapter seven is missing in some manuscripts and some manuscripts it's out of order. In the Greek, the like the chapters are reversed. Like chapter twenty eight is in chapter twenty two. You know, like it, you can't you can't even look at the Greek and compare it to the Hebrew because nothing's even in the same order. Uh, they were just editing these manuscripts to make them to fit whatever model they needed it to fit. Yeah, which if if you're just trying to tell allegories, isn't a big deal at all. But um. Uh, if if you're trying to hold to inerrancy or whatever, which we can talk about that later, it's it's such a massive problem. That never, yeah, when I was a Christian, that never really bothered me all that much. I mean, I just, I didn't think that Noah's Ark happened even when I was a kid, but it didn't matter because I didn't think that it literally had to be true in order for Jesus to have resurrected and, and everything else. Right. Um, That's a common approach. Um, I would say only one thing on that, though. If you hold to the allegorical view of a lot of the Old Testament difficulties, um, you can rationalize that. But the problem is the New Testament authors don't. They treat them as literal. And so um, if you say, well, this is allegorical, that's fine. But you also have to admit then that you think that the New Testament authors were wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is a problem. But. You know, I didn't think about it critically. I just was kind of like, hey, this is what I believe. I, I, I grew up, went to mm-hmm. church, liked it. It was fun. Um, I don't know if it was fun. Well, actually, yeah, it, it actually was really fun a lot of times. Um, so, whatever. Um, so what were some of the other, the most common prophecies? There's the young mm-hmm. woman, and then there was, I somehow oh. already mm-hmm. forgot. Uh, the born in Bethlehem. Oh, right. And... The riding a donkey, let's cover both those actually. It's such good prophecies because as as all as always done, uh people will read like half a sentence of a prophecy rather than the whole thing. And obviously you can't have any idea what the prophecy is talking about if you just well, here's a couple similar sounding words. 
Um, so you already know Herod is unaliving these babies according to legend because the wise men say that the, the new king is going to be born in Bethlehem. And Matthew says, well, this is because of what's written in Micah. Uh, Micah says this, says, You, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are of the little clans of Judah, from you will come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origins are from old and from ancient of days. So it's referring to a king, so rightly so. You could have this idea that, yes, the new king the going to come uh, from Bethlehem. And uh, the problem, of course, is that Jesus was never a king, not even close. Uh, and this is where you get into the, the elastic words problem. But he's king like, well, of kings. I mean, he's a king of kings. He's king like. His kingdom's not of this world. Yeah. Um, but if you read the text closely, it says he, he is the one who will rule in Israel. Uh, that's a geographical location in Israel is a geographical location. And if you go further, it spells it out more clearly. Uh, it says, um, he will stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. So the, the Lord is meaning Yahweh. So here it's saying that Yahweh is his God. Whoever this is, Yahweh is his God. Mm -hmm. So this sort of a Trinity right out the window. Uh, if Yahweh is the God of Jesus, clearly the, uh, this Trinity couldn't fit into this. And then it says, uh, they, meaning the Israelites, they will live securely for now because he will be great to the ends of the earth and he will be the one of peace. And they're like, well, what does it mean to be the one of peace? Well, literally just go back to Micah chapter four. Micah talks about this peace period where it literally says that nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. Um, and this, of course, is talking about when we have this world peace, when the lion lays down with the lamb, as it says in Isaiah and whatnot. So um, Micah chapter 5 is talking about a king who's going to usher in the messianic era that includes world peace. It includes somebody sitting on the throne in Israel. And that's why the Jews today say no peace, no Messiah. Yeah, that was I was actually going to say that. I, from what I understand, that's kind of like one of the number one reasons why they reject it it's like, like look our book very clearly says that it will be an actual person it will actually rule we will have peace in our time and you know obviously none of that happened so they will say well that's the second coming and then you have to remind them yes but if you're saying that he's going to do it in the future you're by uh, definition, admitting that it's unfulfilled, which means you can't say that oh, Jesus yeah. fulfilled his prophecy because it's unfulfilled. But he's gonna. Just you yeah, wait. He'll do it. Just you wait. I know it. Just like uh, yep. the, the Supreme Court's gonna reinstate Trump. Just wait. I can't. <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. Um, okay, so there's the uh, born in Bethlehem. Now, I this is... um. I thought I heard this from somewhere, and then after I looked into it, I was like, oh, that's wrong. I shouldn't say that. But I, I thought there was some kind of weird discrepancy where it's like, does it say he was born both in Bethlehem and uh, Nazareth? But they just say he's from Nazareth in some of the texts, right? That's correct, yeah. Okay. And in fact, at one, at one location, Matthew tries to equate being from Nazareth as another messianic prophecy. Um, but there's no prophecy saying that the Messiah is going to come from Nazareth. Uh, the closest you'll get is like Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, where it calls the Messiah a branch, uh, which in Hebrew is, is like Netzer, um, which is the same uh, three-letter consonant uh, uh, pattern that you would get with the town of Nazareth. So he's really just making a cute little play on words. There's no prophecy about a Messiah coming out of Nazareth. Hmm. Um, so since we're talking about... Um... Jesus's birth, we should probably talk about Jesus not being of the house of David. Cause that seems like oh, another yes. really important when you were, when you were listing the biggest ones, I thought you were going to say that one. Yeah. Being from the line of David, yeah. that honestly, that one doesn't come up as much as it should. Yeah. Um, but it should come up. Uh, maybe we should take a, take a look at something real quick. Sure. So you already know that the, in the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, uh, both of those genealogies go to Joseph. Both yeah. of them. I always, um, and people, I, I couldn't recite to you from memory how we know that because it's really convoluted. But yeah, people would say 
that Mary and Joseph, they have the same great, great grandfather or something. Um, so the, the genealogy is like line up, but there, I can't remember how it's like, no, we know that's not the case because of like this person, that person, but I always, there's so many names and stuff to keep track of in this. It's impossible. That's why I admire your ability to do it so much. Yeah. So, um, if you believe the, the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, you must also believe that just being adopted by a father from that genealogy is enough um because he definitely wasn't born from joseph according to the narrative yeah that's e even if you grant everything it completely is destroyed at the end because joseph's not his dad right that's the other thing and um even in the lineages you've got two significant issues like if you go to matthew as part of the lineage right before the babylonian deportation it says, after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel. The problem is, if you go to Jeremiah 22, um, God punishes Jeconiah, also known as a Coniah, and says that all, all of his offspring are cursed, and they will never sit on the throne of Israel, ever. Um, so you you can't have you cannot have uh, somebody sitting on the kingly throne of Israel that came from the line of Jeconiah um, because his offspring was cursed. And then if thus you go to Luke, the Lord, oh, yeah, thus saith the Lord. That's yeah, right. That's, that's uh, pretty. That's pretty authoritative. You don't get much more than that. And no. then Luke presents his own problems. So if you go to Luke, uh, you'll you'll notice that in chapter three when it talks about. Um, which son of David begat who? It says, let's see, I'm in verse 31. Uh, it says, uh, Mattathiah, the son of Nathan, the son of David. What, wait a minute, hold on. Now we're going through Nathan instead of Solomon. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to the Old Testament, God promises that he's going to establish the throne of Judah through Solomon, not through Nathan. It says he's going to establish the throne through Solomon's lineage forever. And so um, that's problematic because, well, if that's the case, it's irrelevant who came from Nathan. So you can throw Luke's genealogy right out the window. Nobody cares. So even if Luke's genealogy was for Mary, and the funny thing is, like, they say this is an attempt I see, like, like one's for Mary, one's for Joseph, but which is which? I don't Neither. think any. The I don't think anybody attempts to tell you which is which. You know, so that's a that's right. a big problem. But if the Luke one, even if we say Luke, even if we're generous and we say Luke is Mary and Matthew is Joseph, well, for Mary then, because it doesn't come through Solomon, then that's not, then it fails. Right. So we can even be charitable to it and it still kind of falls apart. And the marine lineage is a fabrication anyways. The, the early church all the way up into the Reformation period understood this to be two different lineages to Joseph. Because like if you go to Luke chapter 323, it says Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. He was the son as thought of Joseph of Heli, the son of um, Matah, the son of Levi. So both lineages go directly to Joseph. The, Mary's never mentioned here other than the, you know, the wife of, of Joseph. If you go to like Eusebius church history, Eusebius explains that the reason why the lineages are different. Um, was because um, it was um, one of the ancestors, I think it was the great-grandfather of Jesus. Um, there was a stepfather and a real father that were involved with the same woman. And that's how you get two different lineages that end up connecting to Joseph. Um, so Eusebius and the rest of the church history never explained it as being about Mary. That's kind of a modern invention. And I don't know who invented it, and I don't know why it has stuck around. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah, the the attempts that I hear people say is they're both saying it's from Joseph, but that's how you would talk about th that's mm. because Mary okay. is Joseph's wife. She's his property or whatever. So you still would say Joseph in first century Palestine because it was not a very progressive society or something like that. But is there anything that backs that up? No, no, you would never, um, you would never trace a lineage uh, through the male members of the family, and then just randomly 
um, end it on a woman and then call the woman by the husband's name. That w- that's uh, never happened. Yeah. Well, we we tried to help you, but it didn't work. Um. <laughs> um. What were what were the other ones you brought up? Because that one I added. So. Yeah, Zechariah nine is a favorite. I, in fact, um, of all the prophecies about Jesus, this is one of the most interesting ones, I think, even though it is short. It is short. But Zechariah 9 is so... If you've never read Zechariah, um, you you should read Zechariah 8 before you read Zechariah 9, because Zechariah 8 talks about what's going to happen um, when God redeems all of his people. Um, it literally says in Zechariah 8... It says, uh, many peoples, strong nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from every nation, from every language, will take hold of a Jew, grasping his garment, um, saying, let us go with you, for we heard that God is with you. So the Messianic age, which we which includes this king that we read in, in chapter 9, is salvation comes through the Jewish people, through the God of the Jews. There's there, salvation is never coming through a Messiah dying for your sins. Um, but even if you get down to chapter nine, it says, "Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! See, your King comes to you, triumphant and victorious is He, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey." And the Hebrew um, is using like synonymous parallelism. Uh, it actually says and. Uh, it could say but. Uh, and or but in Hebrew are the same word. But um, because the Greek Septuagint didn't know what to do with this, and they didn't, they're not good at, uh, they, they wipe out a lot of parallels in Hebrew when they translate it into Greek. They kept this one. And because Matthew doesn't know anything about Hebrew, and he knew a little bit of Greek, he interpret this as meaning, well, there must be two donkeys. Um, when the fact of the matter is in the Hebrew language um, and in the Greek, they're just using parallelism. But in verse 10, it, this is what's interesting. It's not just that a king rode a donkey. And anybody could ride a donkey. Jesus was never a king, and he was never triumphant and victorious. And people will say, well, he, was, he triumphed over sin. But read the rest of the passage. It doesn't say the king is going to triumph over sin and be a king of a kingdom far away. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be cut off, and he will command peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea. What well, This is talking about a physical dominion from a guy who ends all war, it, literally cutting off the war horse from Jerusalem. But when Jesus was around, the Jews were constantly at war in Jerusalem, and then shortly after, they were decimated by the Romans and completely driven from the land, and the Romans even renamed the land from Judah to Palestine just to mock them. Hmm. Um, so when it says he will ride on a donkey on a colt, then I'd, what would that literally actually mean then? Because he's not riding two at the same time. So does it mean he's just carrying the colt with him, like it's tied up on a rope going beside him? Or does he get off one and onto the other? Like, what does that parallelism like actually mean? Yeah. So sometimes they'll say something in Hebrew for like a emphatic, um, um, just to emphasize what it's saying. In this particular um, Hebrew parallel, it's just saying that he's going to come riding on a donkey humbly, right? But the the next part of the parallel makes it uh, more humble. So. It, even on a foal, a young donkey, a colt. Oh, um, okay. yeah, so yeah. not even on like a war donkey, because believe it or not, kings in the ancient world, like during the time of Saul, actually would ride a donkey. They didn't. Uh, horses were not always um, as ubiquitous as, as you might think. So they're saying, listen, he's humble. He's riding on a donkey, yeah. and not just on a donkey. Hell, on a, on a foal. Yeah. Um, so that's really what's being said yeah. here. So it's a nonetheless type of type of thing. Okay. Um, Were there any other, like, we're kind of doing like the most common ones right now. Are there, are there any others? I know you brought up the, uh, the one about the bones, dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat at me. That does sound 
like what happened in the resurrection. Granted, the people that wrote about this wrote about it after it happened, so they could just say that's how it happened. <laughs> but <laughs> I know. But I know. yeah, that's the the prophecies that are written about decades after they happen. That's kind of and even like the donkey thing, like assuming Jesus was a studious Jew, he would have known that it says that. So then just anybody could do that, you know, or I've heard, anybody could. I've heard people say, well, how do you know Jesus was God? Well, he said he was. So what else could it be? I was like, I, there are probably dozens of guys on Skid Row named Jesus that will tell you that because they're on something. So that obviously doesn't prove anything like the, the, the stuff people come up with is so juvenile mm -hmm. sometimes, but, um, so what does dogs surround me? A pack of villains encircles me and my bones and my, my hands and feet are pierced. What does it mean? Right. Yeah. So Psalm 22, first off is just a Psalm of lament, uh, from King David, uh, in his struggles. And if you remember life of King David, King David was captured in war many times. Um, in fact, King David at one point was a refugee from his own kingdom. Um, so King David really ran the, the gambit, uh, uh, gambit of being persecuted um, at, during the early days of his life. And he's got a lot of psalms about his laments. Um, but Psalm 22 is just lamenting his own struggles. And in Psalm 22, he keeps um, likening his enemies to animals. So if you go to verse 13... Uh, or it says uh, in verse 12, there are strong bulls of Bashan surrounding me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravaging and roaring lion. And so he's just, he's making these really interesting images. And then when you get down to 16, you have a second image. He says, uh, for dogs are all around me, a company of evildoers encircle me. My hand, my translation says my hands and my feet have shriveled rather than have been pierced. This is kind of important because most people who read this passage, they're resting the whole case on the fact that it says pierced. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the word that is in the Hebrew documents that we have is not a real Hebrew word. So every translation that you're reading of this passage is guessing as to what Hebrew word it was supposed to be. Um, so uh, some, like the... Jewish publication societies say, oh, it's uh, akari, meaning like a lion, or um, kari, like a lion. Um, some will say, no, it's it doesn't mean that. It means like they bound my hands and my feet. Um, and then um, others would say, um, well, the word obviously was ara, which means to dig, which does fit the context. If he said, the dogs have surrounded me, a company of evildoers, uh, they dig at my hands and my feet. Uh, that's something dogs would do. They would dig at your as you're holding holding the pack of wild dogs off. They're digging at your hands and your feet. But the fact of the matter is, the word for pierce uh, dakar in Hebrew doesn't show up here. So um, people, when they say this is about being pierced or crucified, it's simply them just coping uh, with the fact that the text doesn't say that, and they want it to say that. The text. No one knows what's actually happening here because we've got a manuscript error. And that manuscript error, because a lot of people copied these manuscripts who didn't actually know the language, continued for hundreds hundreds of years be until it became the primary reading of the text. So the fact of the matter is nobody knows what's, what's being said here. Um, I'll say a couple of things. If I keep reading, though, it does say... Um, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now that does occur um, after after he's crucified. It's divided among the, I think his, his garments are passed Romans. on to the soldier. Yeah, the Romans. I, I find that kind of weird, but so that does happen. Yeah. But there are no dogs, so it's kind so of there's it's no kind dogs. Of, yeah. yeah, it's kind of weird that the prophecy is eighty percent accurate. I find that to so be that's... just cute and just a. Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Well, that's where the Christians want to have their cake and eat it too, because the the part about the hands being pierced uh, and the clothes being divided, that's all literal. But the part yeah. about the dogs, that's not, that's definitely not literal, right? The literal, metaphorical, perfect, unerring but, word of... Uh, Casting lots for somebody's clothing was incredibly common in the ancient world. Like if you captured somebody in battle, 
That's exactly what you would do. You would take their swords, their armor, their clothing, and whoever captured you would cast lots to see uh, who would get the, the goods, uh, unless they were specifically instructed by their leaders to uh, preserve the goods for like the platoon leader or the king or whoever was at war. So like the fact that David, um, who, who could or could not have been captured in battle, um, if that happened, um, absolutely, they would have taken his garments and shield and clothing and they would have cast lots to see who got it. That was just normal things in the ancient world. Okay. Um, are there any other prophecies that you just think are super fascinating or convoluted or ones that make you go, why would you even say that? Right. Yeah, I I do enjoy talking about Isaiah 53. Um, even though I, I don't know if I've ever talked to a Christian about Isaiah 53 and changed their mind on it, because this is like the crux of their entire, uh, like messianic hopes. Once you, once you wipe out Isaiah 53, um, it's nothing but despair and depression. Oh, no. Um, because that's like, that's like the one that's like, well, even if you debunk all the other prophecies, at least we got Isaiah 53. Uh, but the fact of the matter is you don't, you don't have Isaiah 53. Because Isaiah 53 is clearly talking about the nation of Israel being redeemed by God. And the prophecy literally starts um, in chapter 40. So a lot of people don't know this, but Isaiah was written by three different authors. Um, first Isaiah is Isaiah's chapter 1 to 39. Um, and then second Isaiah is chapter 40 to 55. And um, there, one of the reasons why we know this to be the case, and not just because of the different language and vocabulary being used, is because it covers the span of over 200 years. Uh, unless you believe Isaiah lived for 200 years, it would be improbable that somehow uh, he was still writing at the time. And the author of Second Isaiah knows who King Cyrus was. King Cyrus came 200 years after King Ahaz. King Ahaz, as we talked earlier, in Isaiah chapter 7, was living about 725 BCE. Um, King Cyrus, remember, uh, came in uh, and rescued um, all the people from Babylon in 539, almost 200 years different. Uh, Isaiah didn't live that long. Mm, yeah. And that would be a contradiction to God saying that his spirit will not strive with man for uh, more than 120 years. Um, so oh, in, anyway, uh, as long as in you're... Genesis? I will limit man. Right. Yeah, I've heard people say, no, that's how much time they're giving Noah to build the ark. But when you keep reading, it says that the flood happens exactly 100 years after he said that. I was actually thinking about that earlier. Cause that, that Right? The flood happens exactly 100 years so, after the warning. And God says, I will limit man's days to 120 years. And doesn't Moses die at the age of 125 or 120? Like it it really well syncs with that. I will limit their days to 120 years thing. So yeah, you've got a couple, couple issues with interpreting that passage, because if you do the, the ages of Noah's sons, the ages and dates, uh, uh, times that when they were born were given, um, it comes out to like a 89 years. Um, so it definitely wasn't 120 years. That being said, uh, most people interpret that as meaning the lifespan of people will gradually decrease because that's yeah. kind of what you see. Each patriarch that comes after Noah, their lifespan is shorter and shorter until it's like roughly around uh, less than 120. Um, but Isaiah came hundreds of years after that, so he should not have been an exception. Um, so, But anyways, in Second Isaiah, the author is building a theme. Chapter 40 to 55 is all on the same thing. It's about how God is about to redeem his servant Israel from Babylon and glorify them. And then all of the nations are going to see the glorification of Israel and know that Yahweh is the one true God because he did the impossible. Um, but he lists the servant multiple times. Isaiah 41, 8 through 9. Isaiah, if you believe Isaiah wrote it. Uh, said, but you Israel, my servant, and Jacob, uh, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth and called you from its furthest corner, saying to you, that you are my servant. So we already have at the beginning of Second Isaiah a theme: Israel is servant. Then he says it again in Isaiah forty-three ten: You are my witnesses. 
plural, referring to a multitude of people. You're my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. So again, the chosen servant is Israel. And then Isaiah 44, 1 through 2. But hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Uh, 44, 21. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, you are my servant. 45, 4. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. 48, 20. Go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy, and send it forth to the ends of the earth. The Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. And isn't it interesting? As this theme continues to build, we see the servant being redeemed in chapter 53, 52 and 53. So um, clearly the, the nation of Israel is the servant. It's not a Messiah. It's not a Jesus. It's not a single individual um, that is suffering, despite the fact that um, the narrative in the Gospels was written to parallel this particular passage. Um, this is not talking about a single individual. Well, I hate to checkmate you, but it says right here in chapter 53, verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. That's the crucifixion. Right. <laughs> right, yes, and that is true. So if you read Second Isaiah, he says over and over again that the nation of Israel is given as a light to the nations, a covenant to the people, and that because of their vindication— the nations will run to them and they will realize that they have pierced the Lord's servant. They had done wrong to the nation of Israel. So if we go, you can see this in Isaiah 55. Let me pull it up real quick. In 55 verses 3 through 5, he talks about um, the nations coming to recognize uh, Israel. It says, I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my sure and steadfast love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the people. See, you will call nations that do not know you, and nations that do not know you will run to you, because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, has glorified you. So the, the nations will come to know Yahweh through the glorification of Israel. And that's why you see a punishment in, in chapter 53, because in verse 40, in chapter 40, it starts out, God is saying, hey, you've paid your crime. You've paid your punishment. In fact, you've received double for your crime. Now that you've received double for your crime, you've taken the beatings, you've taken the lashings, God is going to vindicate you. And when he vindicates you, all the nations are going to see that what they had done to the Lord's servant uh, was wicked and they had behaved badly. So it's it's through the the beating, through the abuse of the nation of Israel that the nations will come to recognize um, that uh, they had um, d dealt wickedly with God's uh, with God's servant, and then they'll come to know God. So that's why it says, not to take up too much time, but um, in chapter 52, where the prophecy actually starts in verse 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the east, e I'm sorry, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. So the salvation of God, that all the earth is going to see, comes through God bearing his holy arm. And that bearing of the holy arm, if you read Second Isaiah, is always God vindicating his people from their hostage in Babylon. And that's why uh, he says over and over again that he is going to show his mighty arm to, to all of the people. And then that happens. And it says at the end, I'll end with this, Verse 52, 12, uh, 52, 13, it says, My servant will prosper, he will be exalted and lifted up, and he will be very high. Um, just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, that he will startle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. So it's it's the abuse and then the rejuvenation, the um, restoration of this people group that the nations will then be humbled by. And that tracks. We read that in Isaiah 62, Micah chapter 7, Joel, um, Isaiah chapter 60, says over and over again that it's the abuse and the restoration of the people of Israel that will draw all others to the God of Yahweh, or the God Yahweh. So I want to 
I want to get a clarifying point here. I'm reading 53, and uh, it starts off right away. There's there's this he. Um, he grew up before him like a tender shoot. He had no beauty or majesty. He was despised. Is he the nation of Israel? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the okay. he is still referring to the servant personified as, as Israel, or Israel okay. personified as a servant. And this is what a lot of people miss because they don't read the rest of Isaiah. If you continue on to Isaiah chapter 60, it says, um, your people shall all be righteous and they will possess the land forever. They are the root or the shoot that I planted, the work of my hands. So when you read Isaiah, when it talks about the servant um, being the shoot out of dry ground, that is clarified in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21. Israel, they are the shoot that I planted. Not a Messiah, not this Davidic uh, king. The Davidic king is important. That's not what this passage is talking about. Okay, interesting. Do you think that this is a case of, you know, like Christians much later on started reading this and being like, holy crap, that's the resurrection? Or do you think that the gospel writers thought thought it was? Because this, um, this reads a lot like Mark to me. Um, where is it? Um... Oh, sorry. I lost it now. Um, and he just it says something about as he is led away to to the slaughter. Um, he Oh, right. here it is. So as as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Because um, in Mark, Jesus famously says absolutely nothing. And then I can't remember. He either he says, I thirst. He drinks it. And then he says, it is done, I believe. Um, that's Mark, right? Uh, so in, in it... all four of the Gospels, you have to interpolate, like, well, which part of the narrative is this even referring to? Because during the trial, he does speak. Right. Um, yeah. In all of them. Yeah. Right. So you've got a kind of a couple problems there. Um, the other problem, too, um, is it says, um, let's see, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Yep. Well, uh, he absolutely did. Be, the timeline here, uh, assuming, is when he's being oppressed and afflicted. So, I mean, as far as I can tell, if he said anything, then he can't. This can't be what he's talking about. <laughs> but if he goes more than zero seconds without saying anything, then that's what it's about. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's all that is required. Um, so. It says. Uh, by a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Well, it says, who could have imagined his future? But it's not a perversion of justice that he was taken away. He broke the Mosaic law. He committed blasphemy, and he broke a handful of the Mosaic laws. But you lived in a country where you knew this was the consequence of your of your sins. And this these weren't consequences decided by man. These are consequences that God gave in the book of Deuteronomy. He literally says that uh, these false prophets and these blasphemers are to be put to death. So um, to say that he was executed by a perversion of justice just assumes that you've never read the Old Testament. Or you could interpret it as um, if it's a perversion of justice, but it was done according with God's holy and perfect plan, then that kind of <laughs> means that the plan was was uh, unjust and imperfect. Anyways, um with, with regard to prophecies, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up for fun? Yeah, let me let me end on uh, one of my favorites. And we're going to start by reading um, the prophet, and then we're going to look at what the New Testament says. Now, sure. I play this trick on Christians because I know Christians haven't read either books, uh, the Old or the New Testament. Um, but Hosea 11, just two two verses— says, uh, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And the more that I called them, the more that they went away from me, and they kept sacrificing to Baals and offering incense to idols. Is there a prophecy there? I didn't hear one. Right, yeah, it doesn't sound like one. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. That's past tense. Yeah. And out of Egypt I called my son. That's past tense. It clearly, it's talking about the Exodus. Yeah, so is this why Matthew has to have Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Egypt? 
That's right. Yeah, yeah. If you go, if you go to Matthew, it says that this happened to fulfill the what was spoken to the prophet. But yeah, if you go back and read the prophet, there's no prophecy there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is and what do they, what do they the say in was, response to that? Anything? That they, they are they are dumb. They're absolutely dumbfounded, and they'll say, "Well, you know, the part about the sun coming out from from Egypt that's um, it's a a past perfect prophecy, or it's a hidden prophecy, or." The, they'll bend over backwards to try to say it's anything but history. I've heard every excuse in the book. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, um, it's just a case of Matthew going to the Old Testament and finding anything. He's like, here's two or three words that I can apply to Jesus. Let's just call it a prophecy. What do you think the worst one is or like the weakest one? For me, it would be he will call himself God. And therefore, because he allegedly does, therefore... He is like, I've, I've heard people that take themselves seriously, like inspiring philosophy say that. And it's like, you got to be kidding me because I could just do that right now. And then so. Yeah, so that was I think that stems from like the liar, lunatic or Lord argument uh, that like if Jesus is who he says he is and like he must be God. Um, but I think that the issue with that is every uh, like like. The amount of people who claim to be God or claim to be equal with God or even claim to be the Messiah, there are so many of them that was like, well, how did you land on Jesus? Because uh, according to historical record, Simon Bar Kokhba filled uh, more prophecies than Jesus did. And we have like secular evidence of that. So uh, if Simon Bar Kokhba claimed to be God, does that make him God? Um, he fulfilled prophecies. He was even a ruler in Israel. In fact, we've got coins of Simon Bar Kokhba's name uh, calling him the the prince of Israel. Um, so the fact of the matter is, um, like, how do we decide that if we have multiple people claiming to be something, how do we decide which one actually is the thing? I had never heard of Simon Bar Kokhba. Bar yeah, so I'm, bar I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to look him up. We don't we don't have time to get into it right now, but that's uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that for sure. Um, yeah, Simon Bar Kokhba led the revolt um, okay. in 732 um, against the Roman government, and he was actually successful for about three years. And they even we have we've got coins from the time period that uh, literally counts. You know, uh, year number one of the freedom of Jerusalem, year number two of the freedom of Jerusalem. They literally took Roman coins and stamped uh, over top of them uh, for their new kingdom under the leadership of Simon Bar Kokhba. And then, of course, the inevitable happened and Emperor, um, was it Domitian? Or, uh, I think it was Domitian uh, basically executed him. Uh, I don't know his method of execution, but the fact of the matter is he was executed by the Romans. So how do you know that Simon Bar Kokhba didn't die for your sins? That's that's very good, yeah. Because because there's no book about it or whatever. It's like, well, okay, well. Anyways, um, how about Jesus's prophecy that he did not fulfill, the one that he came up with? I will raise this temple in three. I I can't stand this one because they say. He was talking about his body. But then they also say, because the temple was destroyed, that fulfills the prophecy. It's like, but the temple wasn't destroyed. He was talking about his body. So you're trying to have it both ways here or have your cake and eat it too. Fun fact, this has nothing to do with anything. The reason they caught the Unabomber was because he said you can eat your cake and have it too. And in his 35,000 word manifesto, he wrote that and his brother was like, Holy shit, my brother is the Unabomber because he's the only person in the world that says it that way. So, right. Fun fact. So, there's a lot of, oh, I'm, I'm calling them lies that Jesus told. And um, the one about the temple. So, the one about the temple to me, particularly, I've always believed that that was written after the fall of the temple. Um, but the fact of the matter was, um, predict the, if you believe that it was written before the fall of the temple and if you believe that Jesus actually said it, um, the idea that the temple was going to be demolished by the Romans wasn't a hard thing to predict. If you just knew the geopolitical climate, uh, Rome was at the cusp of destroying 
um, Jerusalem for like 50 or 60 years before they actually did it. So, um, and, and if you read in the Talmud, so if you go to Talmud, um, I want to say in uh, the Mishnah, go to like Sanhedrin, um, I don't know, like 84 to, to 98. They talk about uh, events that might be uh, soon to come. A lot of the, the people of that time period literally believed that the temple was going to be destroyed. Jesus wasn't the only one saying it. If you just read the Mishnah, the Saint, the people um, that were writing, the rabbis, were predicting it as well. So it's, it's not like a novel thing. Jesus was part of a tradition that already believed that before the Messiah would come, uh, Jerusalem would be sacked and the, the temple would be destroyed. And they got that from Daniel chapter 9. Because uh, Daniel chapter 9 talks about that. Daniel chapter 9 is just a failed prophecy from the second century. It has nothing to do with uh, what was happening in Jesus' time period. But they interpreted it as being about their time period. Um, and that's why it's, Jesus said the temple must need to be destroyed. So um, that's, that's kind of what's happening there. But Jesus, um, he couples like the fall of the temple in Matthew 24 with his second coming. And that's the problem. The problem is that he gave a timeline for his second coming on multiple occasions and he failed every time. Yeah. Matthew I, 10, 23. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, uh, from what I've heard people say, Paul thought Jesus was going to come back during his yes. lifetime. Uh, everybody's kind of thought that. You know, like, I've seen polling where up to like a third of Americans think the world will end in their lifetime. And it's like, the world <laughs> like and, and i i think a huge amount of it comes from believing that this second coming and whatever is going to happen right and a lot of people don't realize that jesus did give a cutoff point for the second coming um and that's why paul and others thought he was coming so soon um in first thessalonians chapter 4 paul says hey we who are still alive will be caught up in the air with him yep what would it mean we who are still remaining a lot uh, because, but he says, Matthew 10, 23 says, truly, I tell you, you will not have finished going through all the towns of Israel before the son of man comes. And then a couple chapters later in 16, he says, the son of man is to come with his angels in the glory of the father. And he will repay everybody for what they have done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death for they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. And that's literally what he says in 25 he's going to do. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory with the angels, then he will sit on the throne of glory with all the nations gathered before him, and he will separate one another. So that's the judgment day. That's the second coming. And he says it's going to happen. And some of you will not have tasted death before that happens. And he says the same thing in chapter 24. This generation will by no means pass away until all of these things have taken place. So... Jesus told everybody, hey, I'm coming back. Be Some of you might not be here anymore, but listen, before the last one is gone, uh, I'll be here. Then he doesn't. He failed to do what Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator 2 did. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he came back. Um, a little bit off topic, but we, you know, um, if you have time for it, what are not your favorite contradictions? Oh, man. Yeah. So I've got what I would call a narrow list of contradictions. And the reason why my list is narrow is because I try to only cover the contradictions that are like bulletproof. I, yeah. I don't want I, to waste an hour. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to waste an hour with an apologist who thinks that if you twist the meaning of a word enough, you can make it, this contradiction go away. Plus, it um, only takes one. It only takes one. That's right. Um, some of my favorite contradictions, for example, um, is is like, OK, well, uh, what what do we do with God repenting? Because if you go to the book of Numbers, right, it says uh, God is not a, a human being that he would lie or mortal that he would change his mind or repent. That's the same word to change your mind or to repent. But if you if like you just read where that word shows up in the Old Testament, Genesis 6, 6, the Lord was sorry that he made humans yeah. on the earth. Same word for repent. Or Moses Exodus makes him change his mind multiple times. Like he's burning 40,000 yes. Israels to death. And Moses is like, well, please don't do yes. it. And then he's like, okay, you convinced me. I mean, it's just, it it's literally says it. Yeah. 
in uh, 32 14 it says the lord repented uh about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people so that's just that's just a clear um words mean what words mean type of contradiction right yeah. Uh, you've got theological contradictions too. Like, um, is circumcision required to participate in the assembly of the Lord? Um, according to Ezekiel forty four nine, yes, it is required. According to Paul in First Corinthians seven eighteen, Galatians five three, and Colossians three eleven, the Gentiles do not need to be circumcised. Um, so that's kind of a problem. Um, you've got um, also like numerical contradictions. For example, uh, I use this one a lot. First Chronicles 21 and 2 Samuel 24. Um, the prophet Gad is bringing a punishment to King David for taking a census. And the punishment, he says, you can pick from one of three of these punishments and the Lord will do it. But the punishments are different. First Chronicles, the punishments are three years of famine, three months of devastation by your foes, three days of pestilence by the Lord, the sword of the Lord. But if you go to Second Samuel 24, he says seven years of famine, or you will flee three months before your foes, or there be three days of pestilence in the land. So it's either three or seven. It can't be both. Um, so that's just an outright numerical contradiction. Somebody recorded it wrong. They can't both be right. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know what the workaround for that is. Like, well, it could be translated this way or that way. And it's like, then we don't have an inerrant unblemished Bible today. So like, what do you, I don't, I, that, right. that I, that I do not get one of the, <laughs> um, my favorite ones are, Oh, actually, before I get to that, um, we are talking about circumcision. Have you heard about what people were saying when we first discovered the rings of Saturn? No, no. Tell oh, me. this is so funny. So in, in years past century centuries past when people were like trying to figure out how to view the world in a scientific way and make that work with theological beliefs centered around Christianity there are all these things like was Adam born circumcised and people were like well he had to have been because he had to have been right so I was like okay well Adam was never born but like whatever um but this is fascinating Jesus was circumcised we would assume but his foreskin, that can't be on earth, right? Because he ascended body and soul into heaven. And so people people actually, it sounds so stupid, but people took that extremely seriously. They're like, Jesus, like his, his, his foreskin can't have withered and perished on earth because he was God. These are people right. that didn't understand that we shed skin and, and stuff like that, but whatever. Yeah. So when they first discovered the rings of Saturn, it was actually this extremely popular idea that it was Jesus's foreskin wrapped around the planet. That was honestly, now this was a very long time ago and they, the technology was crude. So they didn't really know what Saturn was or how big it was, but that's, that's honestly, there are writings you can look up of people talking about that's what that was. So when people say there's like science in the Bible, I'm like, no, cause when you guys try to do it, you say stuff like that. Yeah, look look that up. You know, it's uh, um, it's fascinating. How I'm gonna spend my Sunday, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um it's, it's it's wild. But I I can I can follow the logic because if Jesus' body is immortal, according to Paul in chapter fifteen of first Corinthians, then we would have to assume the foreskin was also, right? Yeah, people took that really seriously. Um I'm gonna go on a tiny bit of a tangent here. I did a podcast episode on this once. There was this idea of um um, oh man, now I can't remember what it's called. Um, preformationism. Preformationism is the idea that inside each sperm or egg, different. some people were ovists, some people are spermists, they believed an actual fully formed human that was just really tiny was in there. Yes. But that would mean inside of every human, inside of a sperm, are sperms with humans in them ad infinitum. Now you can do the math and figure out that like literally you only get like two or three or four people into this and then the diameter becomes smaller than that of a proton so like obviously not but that idea was extremely popular with christians because they're like because a lot of them were like 
original sin is just such a shitty idea. But they were like, wait, 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 wait. But if Preformationism is true, then all humans that will ever be born were in the garden. And so that yes. that idea was latched onto, and it's been given up That's on. That's biblical. But yeah, it's biblical. It tracks. <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, actually. I don't know if you picked up on this. Hebrews chapter 7 uh says that that's how things work oh really um because hebrews chapter 7 is trying to say that the priesthood of jesus is greater than the priesthood of the levites right and because he's from the order of order of melchizedek right and melchizedek obviously is greater than the levitical priests and uh this is listen to the explanation for this um so if you go to uh, hebrews chapter 7 it talks about melchizedek the king of salem um, and it says, uh, see how great uh, he is. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who were uh, who received the priestly office as a commandment in the law to collect tithes from the people, that is, from their kindred, though these are descended from Ab uh, though these also are descended from Abraham, but this man who does not belong to their ancestry, collected tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had received promises. It is beyond dispute that uh, the inferior is blessed by the superior. So that's the logic, right? So if, if the inferior is blessed by the superior being, um, in the one case, tithes are received by those who are mortal. On the other, of whom it is testified that he lives, one might even say then that Levi himself who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor wow. when Melchizedek met him. So and they're how, saying because Abraham... How many because years Abraham, separate them? Uh, Levi and Abraham? Yeah. About 600. Oh, okay, so it's not like he's his was a sperm in Abraham's loins. It's would have been... That's right. A nesting uh, doll. Abraham... So about anywhere between four to six hundred. So according to Hebrews, that's why um, that's why the Levitical priesthood is insufficient. It's inferior to Melchizedek because Abraham offered um, tithes and offerings to Melchizedek, and so that means Abraham and all of Abraham's offspring are then um, inferior. So um, that is, of course, how people conceived, as you said, of the original sin when Adam became corrupted. So did the seed of mankind. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so turning, I don't know if it's cool, but it's, it's interesting. It's um, interesting. Yeah. Other like contradictions for me, I, I, Judas Iscariot's death. There's like five oh. contradictions there and I will see if we have time for that one. But a couple that I love are, um, how did King Saul die? Did he right. fall on his sword or was he stabbed by somebody? And what they, I mean, they flat out admit it's a contradiction because they say that guy that came and told them about it was a liar. It's like, so you admit that they can't both be true. But, but the problem, the problem, like, even if you say it's a lie, it is a contradiction, which is kind of weird. Yeah. But even if we say, we have no way of knowing which one of them was the liar. The person that said they saw him fall on his sword or the person that said he was stabbed while riding the chariot or or whatever. I can't exactly remember. So that one is just that one's awful. There's nothing you can do. You have to say the guy was a liar, even though you have no reason to say he was a liar. And I've heard people say, like, well, he was scared. Um, and that's how we know right. he was lying or whatever. It's like but we cannot rule out the possibility that the other person was a liar. There's this other one where. Paul, he gets the place of a burial of somebody wrong or or he gives the uh, that's what it is. And what people what I have unironically heard people say is, yes, what Paul said is wrong, but it's not a contradiction because what he said was literally recorded. So it's like it's not a contradiction because that actually is what he said. And it has nothing to do with whether or not it was wrong. It's like, you've just completely blown up everything if you say that. Because now we can just say, argue that everything is wrong. Nothing tracks, but it is what people said. I thought, 
that's the worst defense I've ever heard right there. There's another uh, death contradiction that often gets overlooked, and that is the death place of King Josiah. Um, according to the narrative um, in Second Kings and Second Chronicles, if you go to Second Kings 23 and Second Chronicles 35, it talks about how King Josiah went up to engage Pharaoh Necho in battle, and then he was basically unalived in battle. One account says that he was carried back in the chariot dead to Jerusalem. One says that he was he went back to Jerusalem still alive and died while he was in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, I heard uh, Dan McClellan did up. A- either a podcast episode about that or uh, one of his videos fairly recently was about that that very thing. It's so hard to keep track of because people have such weird names that you can't, I just, I can't yeah. remember any of this stuff, uh, which is why we need people like you. But, um, um, yeah. There, there really are so many contradictions. So I've, I've got, I think, 30 of them on my list. I got 30 bulletproof contradictions. Um, yeah. You want to, let's just do a couple more and then I got to go start my, my live stream in a little bit, I guess. Yeah. One that, uh, that kind of gets overlooked a little bit is John three thirteen and second Kings two eleven, where it says no man has ascended into heaven. Um, that, that one on the face of it, you already know the problem with it. It says in John three thirteen, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven being the son of man. And then just go to Second Kings 2. It said, as they continued walking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. I don't know how more clear you can get on that one. <laughs> well, nobody means nobody who isn't uh, of the Holy Spirit or something. I don't know. Yes. I have no idea. And then I'll, I'll end on this one, a theological contradiction that a lot of people don't pick up on. Um, I found, I find a lot of people who read Revelation, like they're obsessed with the book of Revelation, don't read the rest of the New Testament and people, a lot of people read like the letters of Paul and then they ignore Revelation. So never, you know, uh, shall the two be met in the middle. But if you uh, read Paul and uh, Revelation, you'll find a lot of contradictions between the two. And one of those is on whether or not you should eat meat sacrificed to idols. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 4, uh, which again is a contradiction to, of the Old Testament. It says, uh, hence, as to eating food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is only one God. And then he goes on to explain that since these gods don't actually exist, you're not really eating polluted meat. It, you're, you're okay eating meat as sacrificed to idols. But then if you go to Revelation 2.14 uh, and 2.20, the churches are chastised for this very thing. Jesus says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who called herself a prophet and uh, is teaching and beguiling my servants to engage in sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Wow. So, I mean, either either meat sacrificed to idols is okay to eat or it's not. That's fascinating. So at the next Thanksgiving, I will say, I just want to thank Balam Shivalep or whatever for this uh, bountiful turkey, which we are about to, whatever, whatever. I kind of like that verse from Paul because to me that that you could co-opt that and be like, Christians, can you just let us like celebrate Halloween and just like shut up because these these evil whatever you yeah. say are out there don't exist. So that's a really guess, good point. Yeah, it- I guess you could still believe in the devil or whatever, but all this other yeah. stuff, it's like. Did you get to do Halloween uh, in in your faith oh, yeah. tradition growing up? Yeah, my okay. parents, my mom is was is super religious. My dad, like, he participated in church, and like, I he he's Lutheran. My mom's Catholic, and I eventually I transitioned fully into the Catholic Church. But growing up, because the the Lutheran Church was closer to where our home was, I was going to like Sunday school and taking communion in a Lutheran church, which that might have driven my mom slightly mad internally i'm not really sure she because she never went to those masses with us but um no neither of them were ever like unsupportive of my scientific interests or of of anything like that i did not have a restrictive childhood at all none of my i had a really good time growing up in the church basically it was never the only thing thinking back on it now was kind of creepy, which at the time I was like, because I was really young 
and I trusted my like church fathers or whatever. I was like, yeah, we got to do that. South Dakota almost became the first state to ban abortion. Um, it technically wow. hasn't had, this was a long time ago. This was in the really early two thousands. So I should look that up because I don't know what the bill actually was, if it was just a full blown ban or what, but I remember the church, I remember our priests telling us that we have to go vote for this, but that was the only thing remotely even like political or really even social that ever happened at church. Church was just all about learning about Jesus and like being a good person and stuff like that. Ever everybody was really great. Yeah, I mean the Catholic and Lutheran churches are a bit like that. They're they're much more pleasant than the fire and brimstone churches. Yeah. Than the snake um, handlers. And I know, right? Um I don't ha so that's the other thing and I know guys like you and I get classified as we're just angry against God or, you know, we just had a bad experience in church and that's why we're no longer Christians. But yeah. I never had a bad experience in church. I have nothing but good memories of my time in the church and in ministry. Uh, it's just that at some point you have to be intellectually honest with yourself. You either believe the Bible is the word of God or you don't. And I, I could not uh, continue living a life that was uh, faking that the Bible is the word of God, because it just clearly is not. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to wrap this up. That was extremely informative. I really appreciate that. We'll, uh, we'll do a contradictions episode sometime. That'd be fun. I, I really want to talk about the death of Judas because it's so bad in so many ways. <laughs> there's, there's a handful of contradictions there, including who buys the field. Yeah. Um, why is it, why is it called that? Who buys it? When was it bought? How did he die? Where did he die? It's just, right. you, you can't, it doesn't work. Well, I guess where does right. he die isn't necessarily part of it, but yeah, it's, it doesn't work. But I next know, time. it's wild. Bye.